chatting with Chris Lovell, the sideline reporter for Texas Tech Red Raiders. So, Chris, let me, let me start with this, and I'm trying to get a little smile out of you, but could you argue your best recruit coming into this year is your offensive coordinator, uh, Sonny Cumbie? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you could. I mean, pe people around here know Sonny. Uh, you know, I've known him for, geez, uh, going on about 15, 16 years now. And, you know, I, I think the offense needed a breath of fresh air. And I think that the energy in the building that he has brought has been felt. I think the players have, have all talked about that. I think that uh, the scheme, because, you know, let's be honest. I mean, this is what this school's football program has been known for is the offense. And, throwing it all over the field, scoring, you know, 40-plus points a game, and, and, and you just kind of gotten away from that in the last couple of years. Uh, I think David Yost ha had a quite the resume. He's done it at other places. It just wasn't working here. And some of that probably had to do with you couldn't find a, a quarterback that could stay healthy. Uh, and I think there was just some inconsistencies at that position and that, that just leads to breakdowns everywhere else. But it was pretty vanilla from a personnel standpoint. You just ran 11 personnel. But basically, that, that's all you did the last couple of years here. And I think Sonny is going to treat it much like Cliff Kingsbury and kind of Neil Brown, who he worked under both of those guys, where you may run four wide. You may run a lot of two-back sets. You'll use a tight end. You'll, you'll move the quarterback and run the quarterback and do some different things. But, yeah, I think to answer your question, I think that's what a lot of people are excited about around here with uh, Sonny, for sure. Well, that – and then you, you kind of just mentioned it, so let's transition right into the quarterback. Now, you're way more intimately involved than I am, but I've done my heavy research and just keep my ear to the ground. You got three – that I'm aware of, you got you got your big time uh, recruit um, Morton. You got the the Oregon transfer soft, and then returning, I believe you have is your like a 50-50 starter from last year, uh, Columbia. It, 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 who's going to emerge, or has has someone already emerged, or is that what Labor Day weekend's for? <laughs> I'll be shocked if Tyler Shuck is not the starter. Okay, I think. I think it, it really sets up perfectly for the, the way it's stacked because Shuck came in here. First of all, when Alan Bowman, you know, kind of indicated maybe he was going to hit the portal and all those things back after the season, he waited until the first day of classes to kind of trigger his scholarship, and then he entered the portal. Texas Tech was already looking for another quarterback. To get a guy like Shuck that is a Power 5 starter, that, that won – that had multiple years left and to get him here for, for 13 of the 15 spring practices was a boy, a lot had to fall into place. And so had he missed the entire spring, I'd probably tell you, eh, not real sure, but, but he's clearly, you know, it, it's his job to lose. I think Henry Columbia is an ideal backup because Henry is a great teammate. He can be a spot starter for you. It's not real sexy what he does, but he's just a, kind of a good player but it's not he does he's limited a, a bit but he's he's a plus athlete and then it allows them to redshirt or or to slow you know develop baron morton and and also a kid named donovan smith who redshirted here last year so th those are the two freshmen so it's just it, it just it staggers really nicely but I, I i to answer your question charlie i think i'd be shocked if if Tyler Shuck, if he's healthy if he's not the starting quarterback and i think they would hope that he could take this take this offense and it really be his for the next couple of three years. Well, you mentioned transfers and it <laughs> sounds like uh, defense is going to be loaded with transfers this year. Um, I don't even know where to begin on who to ask you with. So I'm just going to let you just run whatever direction you'd like. And, and cause the, it sounds like there's a lot of transfers coming through, through on the defensive side. Yeah, you, you, you know how most – I feel like we, we sound old when we talk about it like this because the rules in the sport have just changed so much. But you Yeah, know, you, I, I, you, this is new to me. I, it's, <laughs> it's wild. I mean, so usually every school has got their, their starters and their upperclassmen, and then you've got this next tier of guys that are either redshirting or maybe there's kids that are a couple of years away, they're not quite big enough, haven't been in the weight room enough. Well, all of Tech's depth now – is largely sophomore, junior, or senior 
that are either been in their program or they have brought in from, from, from others. And, and I will tell you that is still going on. They're about to add or close to adding, you know, a Tulsa corner that may end up being a, a starter. Uh, and, and they, they want to add one more defensive player as well th- this summer. And so th- that's what happened last summer too, is that Colin Schooler from Arizona, uh, who is a phenomenal player. Uh, he got here, early uh, August and he barely kind of had figured had had things figured out uh, but t- t- the big picture part of it is they have a lot of what I guess we're calling them super seniors there, there's <laughs> there's 11 or 12 guys that elected to come back and so that just that's a huge benefit to you and but yeah I I, I think the def- and and so in this past year's NFL draft there was a kid that came in from Penn State named Zach McPherson he ended up playing two years here and then declared early. He could have come back, but he was a fourth-round pick by the Eagles. So I think that the the, the Texas Tech staff has basically said, this is the poster child. We can come here. If you're not getting the opportunity where you are, we can we can bring you in here and, and show your versatility. You're not pigeonholed here. We can do some different things, and and we, we can turn you into a draft pick, which is kind of what, what Zach McPherson did. But, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, because I – our spotting boards for our broadcast trying to put that together it's like these little boxes for these guys it's not just like high school guy red shirted you know you're having to list all their college stats but I mean Reggie Pearson that just came in from Wisconsin I mentioned that the the, the young man from Tulsa that, that that may be about to hop on board that they added a, another Duke transfer in Muddy Waters that'll come in and be a starter that they feel like could be an all-conference guy. Now, you just get him for one year, but it just goes on and on and on. And so they've really tried to beef up their secondary. They've really tried to just beef up their depth in general on defense by staying old. And they feel like that's the best way to do it in a league where half the teams are throwing it all over the field and half the teams are right, trying to pound you and, and, and run it. So they, they feel like they can be a bit of a chameleon and kind of match up personnel wise by, by doing it this way. Your season opens in Houston, but it's at the, whatever it used to, I mean, it used to be what the NRG energy dome. Uh, they change names all the time. So I'm sure I'm saying it wrong now because I'm not one second up to speed. Is that considered a 50, 50 game? Or is that, are you considered the away team? And then three weeks later, you, you open up big, big 12 play against Texas. How's September looking for you guys, you think? Yeah, that, that game versus Houston is, is big for a variety of reasons. It, it, it is at NRG Stadium. It's a, it's a classic or a neutral site game. Uh, you know, you'll have a ton of your alumni live in, in the city of Houston. You'll have as much or more fans than Houston there based on just how much bigger your school is and, and all that, but possibly. And it's obviously a, a weird deal because Dana Holgerson, who was here for eight or nine years under Mike Leach, and, and I think that's, uh, that's kind of fascinating, and it, and it, and it makes it when – you're, when you're a Power 5 school in the state of Texas and you play the SMUs, the UTEPs, the, the Houstons, uh, UTSA, it's really a, a no-win proposition for you. You're expected to win those games. So that's the scary part if you're Matt Wells and company because there's not a lot to gain out of beating Houston. It's a nice win, but if you lose it, it's like everybody wants to burn it down. You know, that's just kind of how the thing goes. But I, I think uh, that, that that's a key game for Coach Wells in his third year, uh, and, and they need to, to show well, play well, and, and, and all those things in that game, certainly. Houston's replacing a lot, so we'll see. But that's a big one. And, and you mentioned, you know, Texas being the first Big 12 game. I think your first three out of four conference games are on the road, which is not ideal. It's obviously well, a bit backloaded. Yeah, two and a half. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, two, two and a half. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, Lawrence the, in basketball world, I'll give you. Lawrence right yeah. now is uh... – <laughs> Yeah, and, and they, they've got a new new coach and uh, the yeah. new new roster and, and all those things. So who knows what to expect out of the Jayhawks in, in year one after they added the Buffalo coach. But, yeah, I mean, so I, I, I think there's a lot on the line in that Houston game, to be honest with you, um, just because – that can kind of set the tone for which which way your season's going to go. Chris, 